The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. The dialogue on this show should not be considered as medical, psychiatric, or professional advice and is delivered only as personal opinions from the host, co-host, and guest. KHLT Recovery Broadcasting is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, the Monty Man. Well, greetings one and all. Welcome to Speaker Monday here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial, recovery talk and positive music. I am your host, the Monty Man. And uh, this episode of Speaker Monday, as always this year, is brought to you exclusively by Origins Recovery Centers. Listen, are you suffering from addiction? Let me tell you something. I personally know that they understand. And as men and women who have recovered from addictions themselves, they are very familiar with the daily battles that you face. Well, at Origins Recovery Centers, they have infused the latest medical research with wisdom from their own personal experiences to create a holistic approach to total recovery. Well, but you say, I can't afford it, Monty. Well, the good news is whether or not you have insurance, they are willing to work with you. Nothing is more expensive than continuing to drink or use. So here is the number I want you to call. 1-844-843-8935. It's toll free and you can visit them at originsrecovery.com. That number again, 844 843 Eight nine three five. All right. Our speaker for this week is Jose P. He is a circuit speaker uh, speaking in the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. He has a story to tell of the darkest depths of his addiction and the recovery from that. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, I, I really enjoyed his share, his personal story of experience, strength, and hope, what it was happening, what it's like. Uh, what happened and what it's like today. So please join me in welcoming Joseph P. I'm an addict. My name's Jose. Oh, my God. I am very grateful member of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, uh, I have, um, besides a bunch of, you know, stuff rolling in my head, I, I have ADD, so my mind travels. And when I share that at meeting, people laugh. They think I'm kidding. I am not kidding. Um, I really do. So I wrote just something to keep me focused. You know? You know, when I got asked to speak, I don't, you know, in the Latin community, there's a lot of Jose's. You know? (laughs) So I, you know, I I asked him, did you have the right one? You know? Um, yeah, yeah, you the right one. Um, you know, and I've been, I'm not going to lie to you, if I've been thinking about what to share, what am I going to talk about, what am I not going to talk about, and uh, it just all went away. I'm not going to talk about steps, I'm not going to talk about traditions, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pray and I'm going to share where I'm at. I'm going to share my story. I'm going to share how I got here. And, and I'm here. And I, and I believe. I believe in Narcotics Anonymous so much. It's the only way for me. I'm not saying for you, but it's the only way for me. You know? If you haven't noticed, I'm Puerto Rican. Um, you know what I mean? Um... <laughs> I got, I got clean in Atlantic City, New Jersey, you know, and it's funny, all those years living in the Bronx, never got clean there, but I got clean in Atlantic City, you know, um, and, you know, getting clean in Atlantic City was such an amazing, you know, journey, and I, I met a, a bunch of great people, and uh You know, it's just been an amazing journey. But I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm not going to talk about what I use and how much I use and why I use and was I born an addict. 
Thank God for Narcotics Anonymous, and I, I really, really am going to try not to curse. Um, <laughs> really, I, I really am, okay? Uh, I believe in um, that spiritual things happen to me on the way to recovery. And I'm going to share some stuff with you guys that I never shared it on the floor. You know, I always, I mean, my wife knows about it, you know, some of the people that I sponsor, you know, close people know about this stuff. I believe in, like, spiritual stuff, you know. And my first experience with what we call uh, in Spanish, a piritita, you know, um, a spiritualist in Spanish, a piritita, um, someone like a santeria, you know, that kind of stuff. My, it was an experience my mother took me when I was almost 10 years old, between the ages of 8 and 10. She took me to this spiritualist guy because I was heading down the wrong path, and she wanted to find out why I was such a bad kid and in a lot of trouble at such a young age. And we walked into this place in Hamilton, New Jersey, and this guy was surrounded by a lot of people. There must have been like 50 people there. And we were in the back. And there was a, you know, there was a few other people there with their kids. But um, the guy said, there's someone here from Atlantic City that has bought their son because she wants me to find out what's wrong with him. And everybody's looking around. You know, and I'm like in a daze because my mother made me go to this and I'm in a daze and I'm just listening. And they and he he says, you know, it's you. And he points to my mother and he tells us to come up to the front. So he says to me, you have a a dark cloud over you, you know, and um, I'm like not even 10 and. <laughs> This guy is scaring me, saying that I have a dark cloud over me. And he says to me, and to my mother, he says to me, because I really, what he, his Spanish accent was kind of really strong, and my, um, my Spanish was not, you know, not my uh, first language. And he's telling my mother, you know, your kid is going to get into drugs. Um... He's going to get into a lot of trouble. Thank you, John. Um, but he's going to change his life. So I'm like, whatever, you know? <laughs> so then he said, he turns over to my mother, and this is how I know it's true, not because I started using drugs, but he says to her, you're pregnant. And my mother was pregnant and didn't want to tell nobody because she already had eight boys and one girl. And she was trying to, she wanted another girl, you know. So he touched her stomach and he said, um, you're going to have a girl. And seven months later, my sister Maria was born, you know. Um, you know. I don't know, you know? This is the kind of things that went happening in my life, you know? Um, you know, as time went on, um, you know, we live in Atlantic City in a nice apartment, and our apartment burned down. And uh, we wind up living in a hotel. And in this hotel, you know, they say some things happen for a reason. You know, even when things happen bad, it turns out good. We, the owners of the hotel fell like in love with my mother and because when the city wasn't paying for us to stay no more, he let us stay there. She worked. They gave us like three rooms, and they just treated us so good, you know. And back then, I used to love to roller skate, and I was always on roller skates, you know like to smoke weed and roller skate for some reason, you know? And I was wondering why I was always out of breath, you know? So, so I met this lady that had an apartment 
downstairs, and she sat there, and people used to go in and out of her house, so I thought she was a drug dealer, of course, um, but she wasn't. It, it turned out that she was another piritita. She was a, a Greek lady, and she had this chain with a big eye on it, you know? So it scared the shit out of me because, <laughs> you know, she always called me to talk to her. And I would never talk to her. I would just keep rolling on by. <laughs> and she said to me, one day I came out and I was getting ready to roller skate. And she said, I want to talk to you. I said, I want, I said, I got a roller skate. <laughs> but it, it started pouring rain. So I couldn't, we were under, you know, the thing. It started raining, so I had to sit there. And she said to me, I have to tell you something. She said, the spirits want me to tell you something. And I was like, damn it, here we go again, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So she says to me, she says to me, I need to touch your heart. I said, Okay. But I'm, you know, with my eyes closed because of that big fucking eye she had, you know, on her chain. It was scaring me, man, you know? I mean, are there any Greeks in the house? Seriously, it's a Greek, it's a Greek thing. I'm not lying with the big eye. I don't know what it means, but she had a strong accent, and she was trying to tell me her name, Tuka. I kept calling her Tuka, but her name wasn't that. Um... So for weeks after she told me what she needed to tell me, I kept calling her Tuka. So she told me, she put her hand over my heart, and she says, oh my God, she says, you're going to live a long life. She says, you're going to live until you're 81 years old. This is what she tells me, that I'm going to live until I'm 81 years old. And I'm like, okay, what else? And she said, and you're going to have three children. She said, you're going to have a boy and two girls. And I said, okay. Tuka, thanks. You know? <laughs> like, can I go now? You know? Because I'm like 15 years old. You know? And, um, and I went about my way. I wind up reuniting back with my dad and moved to the Bronx. And that's where I met Janet. Got pregnant, 1982. My daughter Belinda was born in the Lincoln Hospital. You know? Um, after, you know, after that, um, I kept using and you know how we make promises to our spouse that we're going to stop using, we're going to stop using, and we're going to change our life? And it didn't happen. So one day, Janet told me, I don't love you no more. That's the worst thing from, besides when a woman tells you, I just want to be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. She said, I, I don't love you no more, and that she had met someone else. So I'm devastated because here I am, 20, 20, like 20 years old, and I'm devastated that this woman doesn't love me no more. So I went to the Port Authority. And I took a bus, midnight bus, back to Atlantic City. And my plans were to kill myself. Um, and uh, I met a guy. You know, you ever meet someone, a stranger, and tell them everything about you? <laughs> I, I met a guy. And he saved my life. The bus was crowded. One seat left. 
And I was like, damn it, man, I don't want to get on this bus. And I told the bus driver, when's the next bus? He said, seven in the morning, and it was midnight. So I sat next to this old man. His name was John Pedro Santiago. I'll never forget him, but he liked to be called Pedro. <laughs> so I sat next to him, and he could see that I was in pain, and I was, you know, in pain. And I had this button that I used to wear that said, F everybody, you know? <laughs> so I had this button on, and he's got like this smile on his face. And he says, hi. He says, in Spanish, very strong accent, hi, my name is... Pedro, and I turn on my overhead light, and I went, bro, can you read? <laughs> and he said to me, I can't read English. <laughs> so I wasn't going to, you know, take advantage of a, an older man and curse him out, you know? So... He asked me, what's wrong? And I said, nothing. And he asked me again, okay, what's wrong? So then he started automatically talking about himself. You know, that he had a wife and one daughter, and he lived in Atlantic City on Sovereign Avenue, and he told me his address. And I'm like, why is this guy telling me all this? So finally, I opened up. And I told him that, what happened, and I'm ready to, I'm going to go kill myself, but I wanted to say goodbye to my mother, you know. And um, how I was going to kill myself, I was going to jump in the ocean so they wouldn't even find me. Um, we talked all the way to Atlantic City. When we got to Atlantic City, he says to me, Hang in there, Jose. All in Spanish. I can't say it the way he said it in Spanish. He said a few things, but he said, before I got off the bus, he said, your life is going to change by the time you turn 25 years old. So I said, okay. <laughs> but he... He said, just keep your daughter in your head. Don't kill yourself. You have a daughter. You don't want her to grow up knowing that her father gave up. So, you know, didn't kill myself, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, and I have to say that I got clean July 24th. 1988, two months after my birthday, and I was 25 years old. And it's funny, you know, like before we get clean, we always want to do that last one. I was waiting for this guy to take me to detox, and I... You know, I had 20 bucks, so I went to cop, and I wind up getting beat. <laughs> and I walked all the way back home, and I cried to my mother, and I said, I, I can't wait until 2 o'clock. You know, I said, I got to do something to just, you know, compose myself. She gave me $20, of course. You know, I went and copped. I went and bought one bag, and I swear to God, if I'm lying on dying on my children, the name of the bag was This Is It. <laughs> and I'm walking home, just looking at this bag, it, you know? It, wa it wasn't like, this is it, this is the shit, it was like... Jose, this is it. You know, you're, you're done after this. You know, so I got clean. You know, I, I went into the detox, and then I went to a rehab, and I'm still clean. 
you know. I, I came into Narcotics Anonymous, you know. It's, I tell you, Narcotics Anonymous has changed my life. The steps has changed my life. So I got clean in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Like I said, met some great people. Six months, I got a sponsor, you know. And when I celebrated my first year clean, I was so excited to have a year. And I was um, walking to the meeting because I didn't have a car. I used to walk to the meeting. And all of a sudden, I thought about John Pedro Santiago because he told me to look him up to let him know that he was doing, that I was doing well. So I was trying to remember his address. I know it was Sovereign Avenue, and, you know, I couldn't remember. So I said, okay, how many Puerto Ricans can live on Sovereign Avenue? It was all a Puerto Rican street. I mean, there was, it was all Boricuas. It was all in the mailboxes. Santiago, Santiago, Rivera, Gonzalez. I was like, what the fuck? You know? I was like, oh, my God, you know? So I kept going to house to house and, and knocking, ringing in the apartments and saying, I'm looking for John Pedro Santiago, but he likes to be called Pedro. No, nobody here by that name. Nobody here by that name. So finally, I go up. I remember his address. It was 356. I remember his address. I look across the street. I go, wow, that's it right there. I run over there because I'm so excited, you know, a year clean, and I want to let him know that he was a big part of it. So I knock on the door. This girl comes out and says, hey, I, I say, hi. I mean, this might sound crazy, but I'm, I'm looking for this guy named John Pedro Santiago. Um, you know, he's about 5'5", five, five, mustache, salt and pepper hair, blah, blah, blah. And it was the wrong house, you know? So I was ready to give up, and I walked some more. And then I just went to another house, and that was the house. So another girl came up, and I said, Hi, I, I'm looking for this guy named John Pedro Santiago. And she said to me, oh, he died. And I said, oh, I said, I probably have the wrong house. Um, he likes to be called Pedro. And she said, yeah, that, that's him. She said, that's my father. Um, I said, well, I just wanted to come and thank him because you know, about five years ago, five or six years ago, whatever it was, he you know, he saved my life, you know? And she looked at me and said, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Just like that, so I had to say it like that. <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, uh, you know, I was, he saved my life. And she said to me, she said, my father died 25 years ago. I said, well, we must have the wrong person. I said, I was coming on a bus from New York City, midnight bus, and that's where I met him. And when I mentioned the bus, New York City, she starts crying. Her tears rolled down her eyes, and she said, um, she said, my father died on a bus coming back from New York City. He had a heart attack. 25 years ago. So I said, okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm starting to feel like I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, I said to her, well, I described him. I say he had a little silver little flask, 
and on it was um, to my beloved husband from his wife, Tuti. And when the mother came out and I said, are you Tuti? She almost passed out because nobody calls her Tuti but Pedro. So I told them my experience that I had on the bus with him and I described what he was wearing and everything, and um, that was the clothes he died in. Um, and they, they were getting ready to, um, at the end of the month, they were getting ready to move back to Puerto Rico because the mother wasn't well. She wanted to die in her hometown. We stayed connected, you know, until she passed away, but I lost contact with the daughter, you know? Because every year for my anniversary, you know, I will call them and let them know I was doing good and I'm still clean and, you know, I don't know why stuff like that happened to me, you know? It just did. I went to the meeting that night to celebrate my first year. And I was speechless. I, I didn't know what to say. I was like frozen. You know, I, I didn't know what to say. It was weird. You know, my the sponsor I had at the time was in California at that time. And um, I don't know. I really don't know what to say about that, you know. Um, you know, my my first sponsor sponsored me for 12 years until he relapsed, you know. He realized we're 13 years clean, and um, it was devastating for me, you know, to lose a person like that that you're close to. So anyway, it took him six years to get back to Narcotics Anonymous, and he has almost three years clean, and he's here tonight. And that is such a blessing for me, you know. Um, as my life kept moving on, I met the love of my life, the woman that became my wife, my best friend, Michelle. Um, and uh, I already had a daughter. She had a 15-year-old. My daughter was almost 20. And we talked about not having no kids and going on trips and all that stuff. And it was great and we wind up having sex and she was on birth control, so I was like, yes, this is gonna work. <laughs> and, um, and she wind up pregnant on birth control. You know, so we're in Atlantic City in, an, in our condo and she comes out of the bathroom with her pants to her knees. So I'm thinking she wants to have sex. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm ready, you know? <laughs> but then she has this, you know, test thing. <laughs> and she says, I'm pregnant. And boy, that shit went whoop. <laughs> it went right down, man. So she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, we're going to keep it. If you got pregnant while you're on birth control, then it's meant for us to have this child. You know? So we had this child. My son, Julian, was born September 2002. You know? Our second, my second child. You know, a, my son is real special. He's autistic. He has changed my life, made me look at things a different way. You know, when we found out he was autistic, man, my wife fought for all these services. And, you know, it's, oh, my God, amazing woman, an amazing woman. And uh, he 
you know, if anybody's familiar with autistic children, they mimic what you say. You know, like if you say, I love you, they say, I love you. If you say hi, they say hi. You know, it's just like that. So my son stopped talking. He couldn't talk. Today he's going, right? He's going to third grade. He talks. He has conversations. He reads books. And I don't have to prompt him to talk no more. To say, the first time my son hugged me and said, Daddy, I love you. You're my best friend. That is priceless. Priceless. You can't, you can't buy that. You know? As time went on, you know, my daughter's 20. Her son's like 16. We're like, oh, my God. Julian needs a sibling. You know? <laughs> this was one that we actually planned. But we said, first we're going to pray. I said, God, please give us a sign if we're supposed to have another child. So I prayed. About a week later, this Puerto Rican guy comes over my house, Antonio, from my area, with his daughter, Daisy. And if anybody knows autistic children or been around autistic children, they don't like to be around other children. They like adults, but other, they like to be in their own world. So when Antonio walked in with his daughter, my son ran right up to her, hugged her, started kissing her, and me and my wife, my wife and I looked at her and go, oh my God, we're supposed to have another child. He needs a sibling. So, you know, we had sex, got pregnant. <laughs> And she was eight weeks pregnant, and we went to Florida, and we were going to get married in Florida, Orlando. You know what I mean? We got married in Orlando, so we went to Florida. She's eight weeks pregnant. We're supposed to get married that Monday, and that Friday, she starts bleeding. We go to the hospital, Celebration Hospital, and... You know, they take pictures, a picture of the, the woman and the blood and all that and said to us, there's no heartbeat. So, you, two things you can do. We can give you a pill and you can leave or you can get a DNC. I told my wife, take the pill. My wife never listens to me. So she said, I want the DNC. So we were there 10 hours. She finally got the DNC, man. We were freaking devastated. And we still went with our vacation. And I said, we're going to try again. So when we got back home, we tried again. And about eight weeks later, she was pregnant again. And I'm like, damn, I'm fucking good, man. <laughs> This is what goes through my head. So she goes to the doctor. She's like 20. She she's thinks, this is the story, it gets weird. But this is the miracle. She goes to the doctor. She believes she's like eight weeks pregnant. The doctor does the sonogram, shows the picture. And she said, oh, he said, Mrs. Planton, he said, you're 20 weeks pregnant. And she said, you got the wrong baby up there. She says, I'm not 20 weeks pregnant. I'm like eight weeks pregnant. He said, no, you're like 20 weeks pregnant. He said, no, that can't be because I just had a DNC on this date. So the doctor, they go all the way back to, you know, to do the thing. My wife was still pregnant from the DNC that I did. And we're like, oh, my God. So... The hospital in Florida kept calling us for the $50 copay. <laughs> and I said to them, dude, listen, 
You don't want to be messing with my wife. You guys just gave my wife a DNC. She is still pregnant. She's ready to sue you. But I said, we're not going to sue because this is a miracle. You know? So we kept going. About a month or so later, she started bleeding again. We run to the hospital. The doctor said, the baby's okay. We had to go every three, four days to the hospital and check and everything. It was the toughest pregnancy ever. So finally... Six, she's born six weeks early. See, and this, ain't, I, and this ain't nothing against men, but women are the strongest people on this planet. <laughs> and I have a lot of respect for you. You know, because... I do. They, they are. Any person that, I mean, it's just unbelievable. So my daughter was born six weeks early. My daughter, Maya. You know, we named her Maya Destina, you know, because she's part of our destiny. She was here for a reason. It's, a, it's beyond my wildest dreams, man, how, how this happened. You know, um... Moving along, started a business, got a, a mortgage, a second mortgage, you know, loan, whatever. Started a business, lost a business with this economy. I'm still paying on loans. But see, this is where I believe where some things happen for a reason, okay? We lost a business in July. In October... My wife got diagnosed with small cell cancer. You know, um, it totally, totally turned our life upside down. In and out of hospitals, sick like a dog. We thought it was over. And a few weeks ago, we found out that she's got more tumors on her spine. And we're devastated. Um, but in all this time, I still practice the program. I still go to work. I take care of my kids. I feed them. I bathe them. And I take care of my wife. She's my best friend. Um, and how could you not take care of your best friend, you know? If you're married, if you're in a relationship with someone, I hope they're your best friend. And I hope you thank God for them, you know? My wife right now is in Hawaii because her son is deploying to Iraq so she's devastated about that. She just started her chemo again, and we're gonna just take it a day at a time and continue to move forward. And what happens? You know, I can't afford, you know what's sad is when I get in my head and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have to bury my wife. I'm gonna have to tell my children. And I try not to go there. You know, at my job, some of the people think I'm still getting high. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm always smiling and joking. And I keep telling them that I'm just having flashbacks and they don't get it. <laughs> and some of them... Some of them think I'm into some religious thing, and they ask me, where do I go? Because they want to come there, too. <laughs> and I say to them, you can come. 
I know they won't, but you can come. I said, there's a bunch of people just like me, you know, that are high on life, you know? <laughs> that are high on life. You guys are awesome, you know? I have a, I have a, a sister, and she's here tonight. She just celebrated 15 years clean. <laughs> You know, I have a great sponsor, you know, Jack, love him, I have a great sponsor. Um, I have great friends, I still try to get to a lot of meetings, I love to serve, I love to help people, but I love to help people that want to help themselves. You know, I'm not going to waste my time if you don't want to help yourself, you know, I'm not doing it. So, these, this is what the steps mean to me. And I'm so glad that this is a we fellowship and everybody comes up with their own everything. You know, the steps for me are about meaning. They give you meaning. You know, they teach you about trust. They teach you about self-forgiveness. You know, in the fourth step, you find out who you really are. You know? And the, tra the traditions... They teach you about purpose. And what I mean by purpose is feeling that you belong somewhere, that you're a part of service, you know, that we learn how to serve in NA, and in turn, we learn how to serve others. One of, the, one of the reasons why I don't wear NA shirts no more, and I'm not knocking anybody that wears them, this is my own experience on why I don't. I had a white shirt that said, my gratitude speaks when I care and share with others the N.A. way. And one day in, in Ventnor, I'm at a Wawa, you know, and I park in the handicapped spot. <laughs> because because I'm lazy. <laughs> so I come out, and this old man says to me, you know, you're not supposed to park there. And I said to him, why don't you mind your effing business? So he came up to the car, and I thought he was going to hit me. And he said to me, you know the difference between you and I? He said, I would never curse at you. So... As I'm driving away, slithering in my seat, I stop at the next door, CVS, and I'm still thinking about this old man. I get to my girlfriend's house. I walk in, and this old man is sitting in my living room. And I said, oh, shit. I said, how did he find my house? <laughs> you know? And it turned out that it was my girlfriend at the time's father um, <laughs> visiting from Philadelphia. And he didn't say nothing. He didn't mention it to her. He didn't say nothing. He let me squirm <laughs> all night. Needless to say, that relationship didn't last. <laughs> but that's the reason why I don't wear NA shirts no more. Because when I act like an idiot, I want to remain anonymous. Thank you for letting me share. All right, thank you, Joseph, very, very much. Hey, listen, uh, don't forget to tune into all of our shows, Wednesdays and Fridays updated, our specialty shows, as well as all of our workshops and our podcast broadcasting 24-7 right here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. Hey, listen, until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man, and I am wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye now. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Kitty, kitty.